This is what's called an anamorphic lens, and it's one of those things that subconsciously, when you see it, it feels cinematic. And mostly because there have just been a plethora of feature films and even Netflix series and stuff now that are shot on anamorphic lenses. Films like Star Wars, for me as a child, were always just so beautifully shot in, a, you know, kind of like that cool sci-fi kind of way. Films like Pulp Fiction, Inception more recently, Blade Runner, films that have a very distinct look to them where I don't think most people understand why that look is happening or what it is. And not all of it comes from the lens, but as we know as photographers and filmmakers, a lot of our image is derived from what we are putting in front of our film or our sensor. Now there's a video by In-Depth Cine on YouTube that I'll link to, and they do a absolutely fantastic job of going over the difference between anamorphic and spherical lenses. If you want to dive deeper into all of those characteristics and things like that, uh, I would absolutely recommend checking that video out. But I'm just going to do a really quick overview uh, as to some of the main kind of characteristics and understanding of what these lenses do. Back in the 50s, they did a lot of films in a very like four by three, almost like square aspect ratio. And then in the early 50s, there was a filmmaker that wanted to put out, I believe, a, a biblical type of movie called The Robe, and they used an anamorphic lens that was shaped on the inside. You can kind of see it here in more of an oval pattern than a spherical pattern. And through all the optics, what ends up happening is the image is compressed down into a smaller form factor, and then you use another anamorphic lens when you project to widen that field of view out. So basically what you're getting on, let's say a 50 millimeter lens is a 50 millimeter field of view vertically, and then it stretches it out by anywhere between like 1.25, 1.33, 1.6, 1.8, 2x times to widen that field of view out quite a bit. And obviously it's going to come down to the sensor size uh, or film size, and then your squeeze factor to determine how wide of a you know cinema scope you're gonna get out of those kind of things. Now in doing that, uh, a lot of those lenses introduced a ton of different things that normally on a lens would be something you would not be into. So a characteristic of anamorphic lenses, especially wider fields of view, a pretty heavy distortion. You can see that in a lot of Pulp Fiction, Blade Runner, Star Wars, all of those on their wider shots have a ton of distortion. And it's just one of those things that you end up seeing in anamorphic things as a characteristic of these lenses. You also see bokeh that isn't spherical. Most lenses that I shoot on as a photographer, all of them except for this one, really, are giving me fairly circular bokeh, um, bokeh the out of focus background little kind of orbs you get. In an anamorphic lens, you get those oval, vertical oval looks in your bokeh, which to me is a very kind of defining characteristic of anamorphic lenses and also like those more cinematic things as well. You also see in the background of a lot of movies that were shot on anamorphic lenses that the background is just blurry in a way that is like almost unsettling. It's not a very like smooth portrait kind of thing. It's almost just kind of busy and like you get a lot of just this busy, weird characteristics in the background. And it's almost like a filmic kind of thing that I think subconsciously as we've seen movie after movie after feature film uh, for years and years and years, my entire life is one of those things that feels kind of cinematic about those kind of things. The other thing that a lot of anamorphic lenses get is those really, really distinct flares that go just completely horizontally across an image. I know J.J. Abrams in one of those Star Trek movies was just notorious for having so many of those in the film that they ended up taking it out. And it's one of those things where it can be desirable at some points, but is definitely kind of overdone at times. And so it is one of those things that feels kind of cinematic, but it's not always something you want. Now, I've always been intrigued by anamorphic lenses, but there's so many things that you have to normally do. They're either incredibly expensive, usually really large, 
And if you didn't want to go with a traditional anamorphic lens, you're going to have to find old projection lenses and then try to use like a focusing lens and then a projection lens and just like this mess to try to make work. And recently there have been a bunch of different companies that have been coming out with more budget friendly cinema lenses that are anamorphic. One of the first ones was one of these from, uh, I think it's Sure. They came out with this 50 1.8 anamorphic, and this is the FX3, which is a full frame sensor. This only fully covers an APS-C or Super 35 sensor, but it was on sale for pretty cheap on b &H a few months ago. And something I really love to do at weddings is to just bring something that is interesting or a little bit different Typically, it's a film camera. Typically, it's, you know, maybe a point and shoot or medium format or some sort of lens that I'm testing or something. I decided that since I wanted to be able to pull stills from this instead of shooting a bunch of photos, I wanted to be able to have the video aspect just in case I wanted it, but I wanted to have a higher shutter speed. So I actually used the 4K 120 mode in here and just shot a lot of the day on this camera in 4K 120 so that I could have a little bit of a faster shutter speed and also be able to pull out those individual moments at stills if I wanted to. And honestly, the footage that I got out of this was really, really cool. Obviously, while not perfect, the images and video out of this at that wedding I did looked really, really cool. One of the things I did notice, though, was it just had so much flaring, like way too much flare. There was just like overpowering the image at a bunch of times. There's times where it was cool to have some of those flares moving in and out. But for a wedding, the blue flares were just like over the top. It works for sci-fi stuff, I guess, but I would way rather have a neutral flare or maybe like a gold flare. But this one in particular, it's not a review necessarily on this lens, but just know that these ones are going to give you a ton of flaring. So because those flares were just like way too much, I ended up picking up this matte box on Black Friday from Small Rig. It was just like the smallest, lightest, most inexpensive one. And sure, I thought about maybe buying some sort of lens hood for this or something. But one of the things that I wanted to make sure I was able to do would be to add a variable ND filter onto here. And with this one in particular, 
you can just still use the regular screw on little ones. So this is the one I have for a moment. And so while yes, it's enormous and looks a little bit too much like a try hard cinema camera kind of thing, but it does cut down on those side flares from things that aren't in the frame, which would have been really helpful at the wedding I did. Now, while I was in New York for the Sony a7R5 press event, I had just one extra day to kind of walk around New York City. And the last night, I took this thing out and just photographed things around my hotel. And honestly, I think that is my favorite footage that I've gotten out of this. Another thing that you can see in this footage is it's really hard to rack focus on this while keeping the image really steady. And so while this is definitely not an endorsement or anything of this product, Small Rig had sent me their wireless follow focus while pairing this on a more cinematic rig. It definitely gives me the ability to move just a really easy small wireless follow focus without messing around with this a bunch and getting a lot of movement. So overall, I think this is a really cool product. It's something that uh, I think, again, I got it on a sale at B&H for probably 400 bucks. So it was definitely one of those things where I was just kind of taking a chance on something. I bought an APS-C lens to try on a full frame camera. And it definitely works uh, if you use Sony's clear image zoom, kind of just go in a little bit, or you can just crop some of that stuff out in post. Some of the other downsides are that if you're just using the camera, the stretch factor is a little bit weird. So being able to use it on a monitor or something that is able to de-squeeze that footage for you is definitely helpful. It's not the end of the world with a 1.33X but it is definitely something that I've really enjoyed, had a ton of fun with and have loved the images out of. I definitely really love to try out some of the full frame models of this, but they are definitely a lot more expensive in the, you know, 12 to $1,500 kind of range. So maybe if this video does well enough, one of those uh, companies will let me have one of their full frame models. So if you haven't already and you think I earned your subscription, that would be super beneficial to me. Like the video if, it was also helpful and or entertaining. If you have any more questions about this, leave them down in the comments below and I'll see you all on the next one.